Demon Hunter, Devil Slayer, Bloodwing. Three superheroes from three different publishers, but yet they're all the same guy. In the comic book industry, a copycat of a character is called a swipe. And any time a character gets popular, clones of that character will appear from other publishers. There are a lot of examples of swipes, but probably the most swiped character is Batman. And there are a lot of Batman clones out there. Probably uh, the most blatant example would be Catman. And years later, Charlton did it with the Blue Beetle and Marvel copied him with Moon Knight. But what do you call it when a comic creator brings the same character with slight variations to different publishers? Is it still a swipe or is it something else? It's hard to say. There really isn't a name for this and there isn't very many examples to speak of, but there is one, the Demon Hunter. The odd story of the Demon Hunter begins with the short-lived controversial Atlas Seaboard line. Atlas Comics first hit the newsstands in late 1974. From the start, they were dismissed by comic fans and the comic industry as imitations of well-established Marvel characters. The owners of Atlas, the Goodman family, were the former owners of Marvel Comics, and they had given the editors orders to copy Marvel and to hire as many Marvel people as they could. One of Atlas Comics' co-editors-in-chief was Larry Lieber. Lieber had connections with Marvel, and boy did he, he is Stan Lee's younger brother. Big brother Stan brought Larry into Timely Comics back when he was a teenager, and he was working there when the comic line took on the Marvel name. During his entire time at Marvel, he stood in the shadows of his older brother and other comic pros like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. But Larry was an extremely talented comics creator in his own right. He was very important in the development of Iron Man, Ant-Man, Thor, and Hulk. And in addition to being a great writer, he learned every aspect of making comic books as he was growing up. He could draw, ink, color, letter, edit, you name it, he could do it. When a Marvel title fell behind production schedule, Larry would jump in and help out to get the book to the publisher on time. And if you're an MCU fan, you may have noticed Larry Lieber's name on the film credits. His name is usually right next to Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and that gives you an idea of how important he was in the development of these characters. By the time Larry was made sole editor-in-chief of Atlas, stealing talent from Marvel was difficult. Marvel and DC had circled the wagons after the first Atlas bullpen raid. The big two forced their freelancers to sign exclusivity contracts, this was the first time this had happened in mass in the comic book industry. At this point, only a small pool of talent was available for them to hire. Lieber went all in to recruit Marvel editor writer David Anthony Kraft. Kraft got his start writing horror comics for Skywald when he was still in high school. With his Skywald pedigree, Marvel hired him to work on their horror comics like Tales of the Zombie. When Lieber took over the Atlas line, he hired Kraft to be his assistant. Kraft and Lieber convinced another Marvel freelancer to join them at Atlas. That person was Rich Buckler, and Buckler was a triple threat. He was a writer, penciler, and inker. At this moment in time, he was doing pencils on the Fantastic Four and writing and drawing Deathlock. Somehow, he had fallen through the exclusivity contracts. Lieber managed to lure both of these talented guys with the pitch that they could create something new and that there would be no interference from editorial. In addition to comics, Kraft had been freelance writing music articles, and he was known in the New York City music scene, and he was friends with bands like Bloister Cult and Kiss. In the 1970s, the hard rock, later to be called heavy metal music scene, was heavily influenced by the occult. Bands like Blue Oyster Cult and Led Zeppelin put their occult themes in their lyrics and visually did so on their album covers. For his writing, Kraft often pulled ideas from the music he was listening to. He would turn song titles into story titles. He would rework lyrics into his narration boxes and dialogue, and this gave his work more of a poetic feel. From the start, Kraft and Buckler decided that they wanted to do an occult hero. 
together. They created the Demon Hunter. And on the opening page, they answer the question for the readers. What does a demon hunter do? Everything he can to prevent xenogenesis, the rebirth of the demon race here on Earth. His name is Gideon Cross. He is a telepath, and he is more. As the harvester of eyes for a mysterious cult, he has been endowed with certain powers. Among them, a shadow cloak that materializes arcane weaponry from the beyond. He is one man, fighting alone against all the demons in hell and on earth. Everything the reader needs to know is spelled out on that first page. But one thing that might have slipped by most readers is the occult rock and roll reference. Gideon Cross has the title of Harvester of Eyes. The Harvester of Eyes is a Blue Easter cult song from 1974. So that song would have come out about a year before Demon Hunter was published. After the first page intro, the story of the Demon Hunter begins with a hitman high atop a mountain looking down on a mansion. He begins zeroing in on his target. Down below, he searches out his victim at a pool party. But before he can squeeze the trigger, the demon hunter appears. He confronts the killer and disarms him with his mystical cloak. Then, using his cloak again, he pulls out an arcane sword from the beyond. He gives the killer a choice, the sword or the cliff. You can see from this panel which fate he chooses. The demon hunter goes down to the pool party below, and we quickly find out that the demon hunter has the ability to disguise his appearance with illusion. The plot thickens when we discover that Gideon Cross, the demon hunter, is in the employment of a mobster named Damien Severs. Like Gideon Cross, Severs has some sort of connection to a mysterious cult called the Harvesters of the Night. Severs was the target of the hitman. He believes that the killer was sent by his senior mob partner, Harvey Aldous. He believes his life is still in danger and orders the demon hunter to go to Jamaica and kill him. After receiving his orders, the demon hunter takes a moment to reflect, and through flashback, Gideon Cross reveals his origin and how he became the Demon Hunter. As a child, he possessed a sixth sense that alienated him from the rest of the world, and as an adult, he was drafted into the army and sent to Vietnam. When he returned home, he discovered that his wife had run off with another man, and his only comfort could be found in a bottle. His downward slide continued when he fell in with the mob, and he became a thug and killer. One day, the mob sent him out to make a delivery. Cross scoped out the delivery site the day before the drop, and the drop site turned out to be a Stonehenge-looking place that is actually the dark retreat for the harvesters of the night. There, he is confronted by a monster guardian. Cross runs through two monoliths to get away, but he actually runs through some sort of dimensional portal instead, and as he tells it, it should have killed him. Before passing out, he looks up. The cult's Grand Magnus is smiling. The Harvesters of Night take him in and train him. They give him the title Harvester of Eyes and send him out on missions. During these missions, he begins to question the intentions of the cult. We then cut to the present time where Gideon Cross is at the airport. He is on his way to Jamaica. As he goes through the airport, Gideon Cross stops at the terminal newsstand. He is shocked by what he sees. The newspaper headlines read that mob boss Damien Severs is dead. In an isolated area of the airport, he is supposed to meet a member of the cult, but instead he finds a demon waiting for him, and the melee begins. The rock and roll influence appears again, this time visually. The demon looks like a member of the rock band Kiss, Uh, The demon has a long tongue, which is similar to that of KISS founder and bass player Gene Simmons. The demon is defeated, and Cross demands information. 
Before being dispatched to the beyond, the demon tells him that the cult is turned on him. They believe he is disloyal and they are calling for his head. And with this information, the demon hunter decides that he must go back to the cult's dark sanctum, the place where everything started. The demon hunter arrives and discovers a human sacrifice ceremony taking place. The cult is raising a major demon from hell, Astaroth. Astaroth is a demon or evil spirit who appears in literature of the Middle Ages, but his story actually goes back to the ancient Phoenicians. He is the Archduke of Hell and only second to Lucifer. This heavy hitter from Hades is taking over the body of a willing sacrifice victim. Cross realizes the danger and flees before the cult discovers he is there. The big cliffhanger reveal is that the demon Astaroth has taken over the body of Harvey Aldous, the mob business partner his deceased boss wanted him to kill. Unfortunately, this is where the story ends. There is no more. As it turns out, this was the one and only issue of Demon Hunter. According to interviews from David Kraft, several people in the Atlas management knew the line was folding before Demon Hunter went to the printer. Demon Hunter was the last new superhero from the Atlas line, and this was the second to last comic book they would ever publish. Atlas Seaboard's final solicitation to distributors featured an unpublished book, Man Monster No. 1, and the book appears to be a crossover featuring the Demon Hunter. I don't have a copy of that actual solicitation, but I did manage to find an unfinished cover to that book. About a year later, writer David Anthony Kraft returned to Marvel, and on Kraft's first day back at Marvel, he stopped by the office of his former editor Larry Lieber, who had been rehired by Marvel. And hanging out in the office was Rich Buckler, and that was the first time they had seen each other since their Demon Hunter collaboration. Together, they lamented the loss of Demon Hunter. They thought the character was awesome and had a lot of potential. Together, they thought out loud that it would be great to reintroduce the character in the Marvel Universe. Buckler had been penciling and writing Deflock for Astonishing Tales. The two creators decided that they would pick up where they left off, but this time with Devil Slayer. Devil Slayer would make his first appearance in Marvel Spotlight number 33. Devil Slayer is Eric Payne. He is a member of a mysterious cult called the Agents of Fortune. The name Agents of Fortune is another rock and roll reference in Kraft's writing. The Agents of Fortune is the title of an album by Blue Oyster Cult, and this album contains Blue Oyster Cult's biggest hit, Don't Fear the Reaper. The Agents of Fortune teach Payne how to unlock the psionic powers of his brain. Upon completing his psychic and paranormal education, the cult bestows upon him a mystically created dimension cloak. Later, Payne turns away from the cult when he discovers their true nature. He becomes the Devil Slayer and begins fighting demons on Earth. Now, one thing that I found really interesting about this story is that the Devil Slayer is introduced to the reader in an airport, and he is returning from Jamaica, which was the place that the Demon Hunter was going, and there's even a reference that the Devil Slayer has come back from battling the evil cult that is trained him. So, in a weird way, they are picking up the Demon Hunter storyline with Devil Slayer. Another thing that jumps out at me about this story is that the Devil Slayer mistakes Deathlock for a demon, and that appears to be the same plot of the unpublished Man Monster number 1 that I showed you a moment ago. After making this appearance in Deathlock, Devil Slayer unfortunately became another bit player in the Marvel Universe. Years later, the Devil Slayer would go on to become a member of the Defenders and play a small part in a few storylines. Uh, a couple of times he teamed up with Doctor Strange in Paranormal Adventures. In 1981, artist writer Rich Buckler decided to go into the world of publishing with Galaxia Magazine. Galaxia came out under his Astral Comics line, and this black and white magazine featured sci-fi and horror-themed heroes. One of these heroes was Bloodwing. 
Bloodwing is almost identical to the original Demon Hunter, and Buckler even reuses the alter ego name Gideon Cross. On the splash page of this story, Bloodwing is floating above the city streets. He declares, I did it. I've succeeded in detaching my spirit form from my physical self, just as the Grand Master of the Crimson Cult trained me to do. Bloodwing returns to his body. He awakes as Gideon Cross. Eleven hours have passed by. Gideon is late for an appointment and he rushes across town to see his psychiatrist. On the psychiatrist's couch, he tells the story of how he returned from the Vietnam War to a runaway wife and a moral downslide that eventually led to him joining the Mafia and becoming a heroin dealer and a hitman. And from there, he begins to tell how he joined a cult. But before he can finish his tale, his hour is up. And the hour is up for the reader as well. Unfortunately, again, this is where the story ends. It's to be continued in the second issue of Galaxia magazine. Ads for the second issue of Galaxia appear in various periodicals, but unfortunately, it never went to print. Some unpublished Bloodwing pages have turned up for sale from time to time on the original art market, but that's the only glimpse we have. So, this is where the story ends, and it's a real shame. The character in all three of his forms never really got to tell his tale. Devil Slayer is still part of the Marvel Universe, and he pops up occasionally from time to time, but he's usually in the background. Bloodwing never made a second appearance, and who knows what his copyright status is. I'm not even sure if Galaxium Magazine had a proper copyright. Um, here's the copyright listed in the magazine. I'm not a lawyer, but it looks odd to me, so I don't know if this is a proper copyright or not. If it is a legal copyright, I estimate that Bloodwing will enter the public domain sometime in the year 2087. However, all is not lost. With a little luck, we might get to see the Demon Hunter again. Ghost Rider producer Stephen Paul purchased the rights to the Atlas Library with the intention to make movies, and he has inked a deal with Paramount. This deal happened in 2019, and they originally planned to release films starting in 2021, but that was pre-pandemic. Who knows what their current schedule is right now. As far as I know, no further information has been released to the public. I will say this, of all the Atlas books, this is one of the best. In the hands of capable scriptwriters, this could be an exciting character to watch. I'm sad to say, if a Demon Hunter movie is made, David Kraft and Rich Buckler won't be able to see it. Both men are no longer with us, so finding out what their actual plans were for Demon Hunter is probably not in the cards. But in any case, this first issue is a great unfinished story, and it's a solid first act for a movie, and who knows, if we're lucky, maybe Paramount will use this story for the backbone of a Demon Hunter script. I can only hope that we are this fortunate. Hi everyone, Fizzfop here, and I actually have a personal story about this book. Uh, I was six or seven years old in 1975, and I had a reading disability. I was dyslexic, but I hadn't been diagnosed yet. And in case you don't know what dyslexia is, uh, words appear backwards and letters appear backwards. Um, my parents understood that I had a reading problem, and they started buying me comic books in an attempt to improve my reading skills. And that's how I got started with comic books. I bought Demon Hunter number one off the spinner rack at a sparkle market. I vaguely remember it, grabbing that and a Sergeant Rock book. And I remember my mom, the reason why this jumps out at me, I can remember my mom seeing the skull on the cover and asking me over and over again, is that the one you really want? You really want that one? Are you sure you want that one? I struggled reading it because it was written at a much higher reading level than a first grade dyslexic could handle. But one thing I did do with this book was trace the art. I can remember laying on the living room carpet, tracing the skull on the cover over and over and over. And I also traced the interior pages and looking back at it, this book was a major turning point for me. I traced this book so much, it eventually fell apart and got thrown in the trash. As I got older, 
I forgot about it. And then years later, I walked into a drugstore that sold discount three packs of comics, three for 49 cents. And there it was, that skull staring me in the face. And I was like, that's that book. Oh my God, that's that book. I must have it. I gotta, gotta have it. That's when I rediscovered the Demon Hunter and found out about this weird Atlas Seaboard line. And I got three bags of comics that day, nine books total, and all were Atlas. And it was really exciting discovering this strange universe of characters. I still remember the books I got that day. Target number three, Grim Ghost one and two, Tiger Man number one, Brute number one, Morlock, <clears throat> Morlock 2001 number three, Wolf the Barbarian 1 and 2, and The Demon Hunter. Wow, what a haul. Of course, I showed these books to my friends at school and they laughed at them, which is exactly what happened when these books hit the spinner rack in 1975. One of my best friends was a big Hulk fan, and he saw the brute and just busted out laughing, calling him a Blue Hulk wannabe. He thought that character was just hysterical. Anyway, it's time for me to call it a day. Thank you for watching and taking that walk with me down memory lane. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Please remember to hit the like button and leave comments. And uh, here's some food for thought. What do you think of The Demon Hunter? Do you think you would make an interesting film or streaming series? Um, and what do you think of the Atlas line in general? Do you think they would make an interesting cinema universe? I don't think they could compete with Marvel or DC, but uh, I think there's some potential there. I want to hear your thoughts about Atlas and I want to gauge whether or not I should continue covering Atlas. And finally, I started up a Teespring store. I'm always adding new designs, so check it out. It's a great way to support the channel and get a great t-shirt to boot. The link is in the description box. That's it for me. So until next time, stay super. Bye.